by Red Valley University, and he has started this project on measuring lots of things on himself about one and a half years ago. So tonight we're going to hear all about it, and then we're going to have a pub quiz, and then after that, Rob will be available for questions and just chatting, okay? So without further ado, please help me welcome Rob. Thanks, Paula, for the introduction. So, um, like Paula said, I have a passion for data analysis, and the last year and a half I spent measuring basically everything in my life. But before I get to that, I should explain what I do in daily life as a job, because that will explain why I'm doing this, actually. So, um, I'm a scientist, a PhD student, and I'm a bioinformatician, which means I analyze biological data with informatics. And I think it's very cool, I like to explain to people what I do, um, but it's quite difficult because I first have to explain the biology, which for me uh, is the immune system, uh, which is a, a complicated topic. So I have to explain the data where we measure the immune cells, which are your defense of the body, and they produce cytokines, and these cytokines are all different kinds, some are pro-inflammatory, uh, it's very complicated. So once I'm doing that, then I get to the thing that I actually like, which is the data analysis. But Usually people sort of get fed up with it once I've explained this. So I started thinking, I need to measure something in my life or do something to create a data set that's interesting, that's self-explanatory so I can actually explain the data analysis. So about a year and a half ago, I bought this Fitbit, which you see here, which measures my heart rate continuously. And I thought, what can I relate to that? Um, an easy thing to track is my music listening. So I started tracking per minute my music listening on Spotify, and per minute my heart rate. And this is the first plot I created. I hope you can see it on the screen. <laughs> so these are the first 10, or the top 10 artists I listened to in that first month. And this is my heart rate. And as you can see, there are certain artists that I have a really low heart rate with. So you can actually not see the dots, but there are individual dots here that are one minute of, of music. But basically these lines are the spread of my heart rate. So there's some artists where I have a really uh, high heart rate sometimes, and some artists that I never have a high heart rate. And of course, this is mostly because I do certain activities uh, at certain music, but I thought this was really cool to see, and I listened to a lot of Al Green that month. Um, <laughs> but I, I really liked, it, liked this, and people responded to it, so I thought, this is cool, so I need to measure more. And once I started measuring more, I got into the realm of what they call a quantified self which means measuring a lot of things about yourself. And, and the quantifiedself.com website describes it as self-knowledge through numbers. Now it's actually, uh, I think there are about 20,000 people in the world that do some kind of quantified self. Personally, I think I'm probably one of the biggest. Um, before I continue, I should do a, a quantified self at the moment. I want to show you my heart rate. So for those of you ah yes. So I hope you can see it, but this is my heart rate at the moment. So you'll be able to see when I get excited during this talk, when I'm really <laughs> calm. Uh, so it's really a live heart rate measurement. Now I told you I'm measuring more, and there's really a lot I'm measuring. There are some things I measure once a week, like a brain MRI, a sleep EEG. I get a, a microbiome measurement every week, which means I try to measure which bacteria there are in my gut. There's things I measure every day, there's things I measure continuously, so it's quite, quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> but why do I do this? Well, the first reason, the original reason, was to explain data analysis to people. But it's grown a bit beyond that. There's the quantified self part, where I want to learn about myself, and learn about who I am and what makes me tick. Uh, but it's more than that. I think in the future, basically, uh, more and more of these devices that we wear are going to become smart. They're going to be able to collect data, they're going to be able to store data, and they're going to be connected to each other so that you can actually connect the data to each other. And I'm trying to sort of make a vision for the future, like what will be possible in, in 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, but of course, 
in all truth, some of the measurements I do are quite expensive, like an MRI, a brain EEG, and those are not going to be available to the public. So there are some questions which are actually scientific questions that we want to answer and that you can only answer when you track one person over a long time continuously, like what happens to your brain once you have a period of stress and then recover again and then get stressed again. So these things you can only see once you track somebody for a few years. And finally, I'm sort of a data geek, so there are some of these measurements that make no sense scientifically, that will not make me improve my life, but I think are funny. So I track the amount of carrots I eat, for instance. I think it's funny uh, to see what will be associated with that. Um, so I've been doing this for about a year and a half, and I'm gonna be doing it for another nine months. So that's basically, I'm in the middle of the, the project. So I've not analyzed all of the data yet. I'll be analyzing, uh, I've analyzed some of it, um, I'll be analyzing some of it in the future, and some people here in the audience are gonna help me with it as well. Um, so I'm gonna show you some results, but I also just wanna describe the process that I do of measuring it. So a few weeks ago, I decided for one week to, to record on video everything that I do that has to do with measuring myself, and to also sort of track how much time it costs. So I'll show you a four and a half minute video now. Uh, and in the corner or somewhere in the screen, you always see this clock. And it, it, this tells you how many hours and minutes I spend per week doing that particular measurement. Um, and we're gonna start off here with the brain EEG. So Sebastian, who you see here, who's here in the audience as well, he helps me a lot with my measurements. So every week, he helps me put on these brain uh, electrodes and he helps me do the MRI. So let's start it. So here you see us putting on the brain EEG, and with this EEG, I measure my sleep each week. So it measures my brain activity, and then I know how much deep sleep, light sleep, and all of that I have. And then immediately, then the next morning, I get a brain MRI. And we wanna see how does sleep affect brain structure, brain function. Uh, and I was surprised at how much noise an MRI makes. I don't know if any of you have ever been in an MRI, but um, it actually makes more noise than you think, so I want to show you, or I'd like you listen to some soundscapes of the MRI that I get each week. actually makes quite a lot of noise. I was really surprised when I first got in it, but I can actually recognize what part of the sequence we're in by the sound. And this is the first 40 weeks, roughly, of my brain. Uh, we're looking for the differences, of course. They look very similar, but there are differences, actually. Then also, every three weeks, I take some blood, and I go to the lab, and I measure some of the parameters that I can measure in the lab. And here you see me uh, basically taking out the blood plasma and storing it in the freezer, the minus 80 freezer for later measurement. Uh, also, I take a poop sample each week, which I can put in the mail to send to the genetics department, and they will sequence it to see which bacteria are in there. So I can just put it in the post. Then every morning and evening, I measure a lot more. So the moment I get up, I fill in a quick questionnaire that I describe how happy I am, how sad, how stressed. Uh, I describe my dreams, so this week I had three dreams, and I type it out in my dream journal. Then I, I weigh myself, which I do every morning and evening. And then I go down the stairs, and I do a urine test. Uh, basically, I can see my pH and a few other things of the urine. I take a picture of it, and later with the computer, I can automatically analyze that. And the thing that costs me the most time is uh, filling out questionnaires. So I spend about a week and a half, uh, an hour and a half a week filling out questionnaires about my mood, who I interact with, uh, what I'm doing. Uh, I do about five a day, um, and it's sort of a comprehensive summary of how I'm feeling. Then every morning, I take a blood glucose test, so I measure the sugar in my blood, similar to people with diabetes. I measure my temperature, uh, which I do both the classical way that you do to babies, which is the most reliable, and then, uh, because I would like to not do that anymore, I'm also trying out air thermometers and forehead thermometers. Uh, and I'll be able to tell you how reliable they are in, uh, in, a, in a while. <laughs> and then also I measure the oxygen in my blood, which you can do with a device that you clamp to your finger. Uh, I measure my reaction speed every morning. Uh, basically, you have to click as fast as possible when something appears on the screen. 
and then I take a selfie because people always tell you that your eyes are like small when you're tired and I want to know is this true so I take a selfie each morning and tell the thing how tired I am. Uh, I measure my blood pressure uh, both at the wrist uh, and at the uh, upper arm. Uh, the upper arm is much more reliable they say, I'm not sure yet but it's much easier to do it at the wrist so um, and it takes quite some time, about an hour a week measuring just my blood pressure. And then finally I have an EEG, a portable EEG monitor that I wear for two minutes each evening to measure my brain activity before I go to bed. And then of course, uh, there are also some things that I measure throughout the day. So once I go to the toilet for number two, uh, a poo, then I record how long I'm in there, but also the consistency. There are, there are apps for that on your phone that you have to record that. Um, I also, I like dark chocolate, so on the wrapper I always write when I ate it uh, and then later I put it in the, in the system. I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, so I always weigh them uh, and then put them in this uh, small device. Um, and also how much liquid I drink each day, I just always, I can just click, click per 50 milliliters of liquid. Uh, I have a smart toothbrush, so I know how much time I spend brushing my teeth in the evening. And then finally, I do sports one, once or twice a day, and I always record how long I do sports and what sports I do. So that's quite a lot of effort. Uh, in total, it costs me about 11 hours a week, including everything, and that includes some traveling time to the Donders Institute, but also uh, sometimes re repairing a device. Uh, and these are all the measurements. So basically, just now I discussed the weekly measurements and the daily measurements, but there are also continuous things that I don't have to put any effort in, like heart rate, breathing rate, uh, location, working hours, uh, transport, air quality, Netflix time. All these things are uh, recorded automatically. So it's quite a lot of data, and you're like, 11 hours a week, that's a lot of time. And you're right. Um, first, I want to show you one small plot that both describes how long I've been doing this. So I've been doing this since July 2017. And what you see here is the hours I spent in bed per day. So basically how much time I spent sleeping or trying to sleep. And you see when I started around July 2017, I was sleeping about eight hours a day. Slowly that has digressed to six hours per day. I'm not sure exactly why or how, um, but this has changed and I thought it was quite interesting to see. Um, and thinking about that, I was like, okay, I'm spending 11, 11 hours a week measuring things but I'm gaining two hours per day since I've started measuring. So if I, if I do the calculation, this measuring actually has helped me spend the gain three hours a week. So it's sort of positive as well. So if you want to do it, just sleep less. Um, but it wasn't a conscious decision to sleep less. Uh, but the other day I was on the internet Googling a bit, and I found that somebody has thought about this a bit more than I did, and he has a good reason on why to sleep less. Oh, let me restart that. Well, I mean, look, everyone has a problem with time. But the day is 24 hours, and you sleep six. Now, I know there's some out there that say, whoa, 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 whoa. I need eight. Well, I say, just sleep a little faster. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works, but apparently you can get it to work and become a professional movie star and bodybuilder. So, it's possible. Um, now, we, we just looked at how much time I spend in bed over time, like over the last year and a half. But I was also interested in seeing how much time I spend per day of the week. So, for the, this is for the first nine months I was measuring. And uh, I was not surprised to see that I sleep least on Wednesday. So, here you see minutes in bed per day. And there's really a dip on Wednesday, then I need to recover on Thursday, and then I sleep normal again on Friday. And on the weekend, of course, you sleep quite a lot. And this is because on Wednesday, we have an obligatory meeting at work that's quite early, and I'm an evening person, so I can stay up until three without any problems, but getting up is quite tough. So I really sleep less on Wednesdays. And I was like, which biological measurement is most associated with this? Well, turns out it's my blood pressure. So if you look at it, uh, this is my blood pressure. On Wednesday, it's always highest, and then on my recovery day, Thursday, it's much lower again, and then Saturday, Sunday, is low again. 
So I actually went to my professor, I told him about this and tried to convince him to move the meeting. <laughs> he wasn't convinced yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. So, so far we were looking at things that changed over time, so over the last year and a half. Uh, we looked at things that changed per day, but there are also things that sort of changed per periodically over time. So what you see here is the outside temperature. Now, it makes sense, of course, that changes periodically over time. It's high in summer, it goes down in winter, goes up again, goes down again. And this is the temperature that I experienced where I was in that moment uh, in the evening. And you see a few peaks here. For instance, here I was in, on holiday in Indonesia, so it really went up. And then I was interested, okay, which thing associates most with this outside temperature? It was actually my resting heart rate. So my heart rate when I'm just relaxing, doing nothing. And you really see that it shows the opposite pattern going up towards winter then going down again, up again, and even in this Indonesia time, you really see a, a quick drop. So I thought it was cool to see that your body just adapts to the environment that quickly, and apparently in winter, your body needs to work a little bit harder to keep your body warm and, uh, uh, and happy. So I thought it was cool to see, and I was thinking, oh, you can actually see the correlation here. So here you see the outside temperature and my resting heart rate, and you really see there's almost a linear correlation between the two. Um, but I was thinking, what is the thing that my body reacts to a lot as well? I don't mean this woman, I mean the, the thing behind her. Um, it's flying. I always feel kind of drowsy in an airplane, tired, not completely well. So I started thinking, what's the thing that changes most in an airplane? Uh, it's actually the air pressure. So for one flight, I recorded the air pressure in the plane. And you see it goes from about 100 kilopascals to say 75. So basically the oxygen concentration drops by 25%. So I was wondering what happens to the oxygen in my blood. Well, you actually see that it basically follows almost the exact same pattern. The moment the air pressure starts to drop, the oxygen in your blood goes from about 100% to 93%. Now that might not sound like a big drop, but in the hospital, if you're sick, people would actually get extra oxygen right around that time when they drop to, to that lower level. Um, of course, when you're sick, when you're not sick, it's not a, a big problem. But I thought it was cool to see that your body really directly responds to the environmental stimulus that quickly. Now, this is point of science, so I thought I should put some alcohol here in this story. Uh, and particularly, I was interested in the work beer balance. Um, so, what I decided to do is to look just at my working day, so days where I spent at least six hours at work and to see what is different about the days where I drank at least one glass of alcohol. Now, unsurprisingly, uh, the day where I decided to have a drink is the day that I was less productive. So this is the number of keys I pressed on my computer that day, basically trying to work. <laughs> and you really see that there's a drop of about 1,000 or 2,000 keys. So, and even if I look at the amount, uh, the distance that my mouse traveled over my screen, the screen, the distance is even bigger, the difference. <laughs> So I thought it was quite interesting, but of course I want to know how's my body reacting to this. Um, so one thing that really changes once I drink a beer that day, then in the evening my blood pressure is actually lower, which is quite interesting. I haven't looked at it the next day yet, like the day after, but I don't want to. Um, and then also my temperature is lower, so in the evening it's only uh, on average about 0.1 degrees Celsius, but still it's a significant difference uh, over time. So I think this is all very cool. I think um, there are a lot more interesting things I could be looking at, but uh, like my mood, how does my mood affect things? Um, but this data I'm not analyzing yet because I would be affected uh, by it. If I know that I'm maybe less happy on Wednesdays, and every Wednesday when I'm filling out my questionnaire, I'll be like, ooh, it's Wednesday. And I don't want to do that yet, so we're going to pick a moment where we're going to analyze it, and then we're going to think of interventions as well to see if I can improve it uh, as well. Uh, one final interesting and sort of warning uh, that I want to give you. Um, this is a data analysis I did on the wind speed outside. So the wind speed, how hard the wind is blowing, and how fast I'm cycling on my bike. Now, what I saw is there's sort of a, a linear relationship between the wind speed outside and my cycling speed. And sort of, it goes down over time, or over the wind speed. So the harder the wind is blowing, the slower I'm cycling, and you think maybe this makes sense because the wind is blowing, you have to put more energy into it, so you're going slower. But you have to realize that every morning I spend 30 minutes on this bike here, which is a stationary bike. Uh, so the wind speed outside was actually associated 
with my stationary bike, which makes no causal sense. <laughs> so you have to think, always when doing data analysis, you have to be careful uh, distinguishing between correlation, which means two things are associated with each other, or causation, where one thing causes the other. Maybe alcohol causes you to be happy, but maybe on the days that I drink alcohol, I also wear other shoes, which is not related to each other. So that's sort of a warning. Uh, there is actually a reason why this correlation exists in my data, but it has nothing to do with the actual wind speed. Um, so in the future, I do think we're going to get more and more data about ourselves. Everybody is going to have more data. Not everybody is going to look like this, basically. Um, I think it's going to be very stealthy. It's going to be integrated into the devices that you already own. Maybe your pillow is going to tell you how well you slept, and your alarm clock is going to, I don't know, be able to tell you how warm you are. Um, so you're not going to look like this, but data is going to become more important, it's going to become more integrated, it's going to tell you more, but we also have to be careful with the interpretation. Now, I'm very careful with my data, I always want my data to be correct, I, I take great, great pride in trying to do that. There are people who do not, um, so I wear this Fitbit and it tells me how many steps I take, and I do that for me, but there are also people who are, are either in competitions, trying to get as many steps as possible, or people who get this Fitbit from their work and if they get 10,000 steps, they get a discount on their health insurance. So there are actually whole YouTube videos on how you can get more steps, and they're quite creative. Here's one guy who <laughs> struck this Fitbit to a drill, and he got a lot of extra steps that way. There's also somebody who puts it in the dryer, so he puts a few socks around it, and then chucks it in his dryer. And then finally, this is my favorite, but you have to own a dog. Um, some people just strap it to their dog and by the end of the day they have uh, all the steps that they need. <laughs> so, this is the end, but I need to thank a lot of people. Um, the Department of Internal Medicine where I work, I get to use the lab, I get to try a lot of fun stuff. But especially people at the Donners Institute, uh, Sebastian who helps me a lot with everything. Uh, of course he can uh, hopefully get some nice publication out of it as well. Uh, but he really does a lot of work, he's always ready, and I'm always five minutes late, and he never minds. Um, and Martin, and Guillen, and a lot of people there. And people at the genetics department who uh, are going to sequence or going to analyze all my poop, basically. Uh, point of science, of course, for letting me talk here. And my family, friends, and my girlfriend, everybody, Marples, who basically are allowing me to do this, even though it takes 11 hours a week. Um, before I end, I should tell you that next week there's the Rob Bug Talks final, uh, which I'm a participant in, where I'm going to pitch this exact thing in three minutes, so it's going to be much faster. Um, so you're going to have to listen well, but if you want, you can go there, it's only five euros, uh, and you can vote for whoever you think is best. And finally, I'm starting a YouTube page, it's really preliminary now, but if you're interested in what I'm doing and you want to see more, I think in about a, two or three months there's going to be some videos on there, um, and hopefully they're interesting. And I give the word back to Paula.